This is Jack Foley. On October 4th, 1996, I conducted an extensive interview with Allen Ginsberg at the Triton Hotel in San Francisco. I'm going to play the second half of that interview on today's show. You heard the first half of it on last week's show. The second half is this week's show, and it's part of the celebration of KPFA's 75th anniversary. And of course, it's also Poetry Month. Here is Allen Ginsberg and me from October 4th, 1996. What I wanted to get to was, was um, one of the things that strikes me um, about your um, connections with people, maybe I should turn this thing uh, over, but one of the things that strikes me about your connections with people, you've had intense um, guru connections. I mean, Kerouac was a guru in a certain way. You've had Burroughs, teacher certainly Burroughs, still. certainly, yes. And, and uh, Tibetan teachers. Uh, sure. Chogyam Trungpa. Trungpa. And, and uh, the present Gelek Lim Rinpoche since Trungpa died. Um, and what's interesting about that... a stupid that, student, basically. Uh, and, uh, I thought you were the most brilliant man in America. no idea, <laughs> but uh, it was mainly that I felt stupid. And so I thought I'd better... That's not stupidity, naive. that's negative capability. Well, and felt naive, particularly. I know, the, know the moment, I know the moment when I realized this, and I figured I'd better start listening to people and stop chattering. Well, but, but, but what's is so interesting about it is that, I mean, all these people have literary connections, they write books, all of that. But there's a sense of needing the teacher who's not just disembodied in the book, but physically present. Oh, yeah, everybody needs that. You've got to get the oral transmission. Well, that's one of the things. I mean, Blake has been dead. I see the sunflowers in this room. Blake yeah. has been dead for many, many years. You couldn't yeah. have that experience of him unless you conjured I him up. I cooked it up somehow. <laughs> well, you know, there's a, the, the, um, the Jungian co uh, conception of uh, individuation Mm -hmm. Often has an. Uh, you were young. You were like 22 when this happened, but. 1948, so I'd be 22. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, I should explain. I had some sort of auditory hallucination of Blake's voice, reciting the uh, sick rose and the sunflower, and then later the sick rose, and with the sunflower, a sense of like eternal spaciousness, and uh, uh, solitude and silence, like alone with the alone, so to speak, but the alone very definitely there as a sentient, vast uh, consciousness or awareness throughout the universe. And then later on, the same thing, except that the, this vast sentience was also malevolent and fearsome or terrible, and one was going to be swallowed in the maw of it, mm -hmm. death, with the sick rose. So they were like pivotal points of my mental development. And I still don't understand what it was, but it was like a psychedelic experience without any drugs a time when I was living pretty much quietly alone, eating veg vegetarian food mostly, in, um, in a solitary state, reading St. John of the Cross and Plato's Phaedrus and um, Blake. And it was reading the text and heard this voice apparently in the room. It seemed like 3D in the room. But I couldn't figure out what was going on, and I never still have. One of the, the I mean, what began as desire will end wiser. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, you had just masturbated. Yeah. And uh, desire was quelled for that moment, and it was that after moment. the moment. But what well, was the desire? No, desire wasn't quelled because there still was a need for somebody. There. Oh yes, no, no. I mean, momentarily. Yeah. yeah I mean, but the no, no, sexual. No, no. Yeah. The erotic impulse also needs somebody there. Even if you got mad at oh, sure. somebody. Not that I had a sex fantasy about Blake, but afterward, I, it was like I wanted some contact with some human. And the youth pined away with desire, and yeah. the pale virgin shrouded with so snow. That was me, snow. the youth pining away with desire. Yeah, in, in the sunflower But it was home. a very sort of uh, a grave, uh, sympathetic, uh, all-knowing, and at the same time, oh, like the phrase in T.S. Eliot, an infinitely suffering, infinitely tender thing. Yes, yeah. This is what this, uh, that's what the voice was like, though not suffering so much as infinitely tender. Suffering is another word that resonates all the way through the selected poems. Mm -hmm. And I should mention, incidentally, that we're talking about uh, Allen Ginsberg's... Uh, and we were just talking about a, a mental incident of 1948. Yes, and Allen Ginsberg's selected poems, um, which came out from um, Harper Collins, and it's just out. It's a beautiful book. Um, I think this, the exact date it came out was October 8th. October 8th? Oh, wow, the day after the uh, celebration of the... Uh, 
Yeah. Of the gallery, of the reading at the uh, gallery six. Let me turn this tape six over. Gallery. Yes. The things that interested me was um, the question of the voice. Um, mm -hmm. You had thought of yourself as having a very high-pitched voice, mm -hmm. and all of that, and then you heard in in Blake, you heard yeah. a, a deeper voice, yes, and it's a voice you became, tone. and it's a voice you say it's now your voice. Well, when I'm talking like now, or singing, say, uh, when the voices of children are heard on the green, or the uh, Father Death Blues, hey. Father Death, I'm flying home. So the interesting thing I found is that uh, as I became more familiar with Buddhism and meditation and mantra, mantra chanting, <coughs> that, that there is a possibility of the voice resonating in the um, uh, breast area, the he heart voice, so to speak, or in the stern uh, sternum. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah. You know, where the bones come together yeah, in right. the chest. Yeah. Uh, the, actually, your voice can... Uh, resonate there and sink down there or even lower to toward the um, more toward the solar plexus and you have to speak very quietly and be very relaxed in your body to do it but it's a natural voice when you're settled down and rested in your body your so I think probably yes. what I was hallucinating was some latent uh, experience of my own body and my own voice Isn't that, that's interesting the, uh, my own nervous system so to speak is what I was prophesying. The poems actually in an odd way like The Wasteland um, seem to depend more upon people speaking things, voices yeah. more or less disembodied around you at any rate than they do on description. Well, uh, there's uh, description. Well, but there's quite good description. Yeah, actually, I'm not putting it, yeah. Float over London Bridge. Yeah, yeah. So many, I had not thought death had so many, had undone so many. Float over across the street and on King William Street where St. Mary Wall North uh, rang, dead, uh, rang dead sound the hour sound of the dead nine. sound, the the sound the of dead nine. sound on the ring of nine uh -huh. or something like that. Yeah, but there's also the whole scene in the wasteland, which is in the um, in in the pub, and there's not a single moment. It's all voices. Talking. It's all voices. Yeah, and the babble of what's it like a pub? That's what you hear. Yes, yeah, right, exactly. But your poetry is like that too. It's so interesting to go through uh, because the radio is on in Wichita Vortex, etc., yeah. etc., et which is another disembodied voice. I mean, what we're doing mm -hmm. now is creating disembodied voices, mm -hmm. and um, there is that sense of attunement to disembodied voice, attunement to speech, which is an extraordinary strength, I think, of your poetry. Well, it gives you a funny ghostly feeling when you hear these voices coming through the air on <laughs> television and radio or reading newspaper headlines and hearing people intruding on your consciousness, so to speak. Yeah, I think it's one of the reasons why radio initially um, um, had voices of conscience. The shadow mm -hmm. was very much a lone ranger. These yeah. are all figures that were really conscience figures, and that sense of a, a lone voice telling you what to do in your mm -hmm. head, disembodied, mm -hmm. very close to the idea of the conscience. But one of the things that Selected Poems presents you as, and this is interesting too, because there's so much reinvention of the self. You talk about the self as unstable, and that's... Well, it's not unstable, it's itself. It's myriad. It's the very nature of things. But, but also... Uh, you want to hear... The I have a new poem that isn't truth. in... I have a, a new poem that is not in the book about the, the nature of uh, identity and the self. Want okay. to hear it? Yes, sure. Multiple identity questionnaire. Nature empty, everything's pure. Naturally pure, that's what it is. I'm a Jew, a nice Jewish boy, a flaky Buddhist, certainly. Gay, in fact, pederast, I'm exaggerating. Not only queer, an amateur S&M fan, Someone should spank me for saying that. <laughs> Columbia alumnus, class of 48, beat icon, students tell me, white, if Jews are white race, American by birth, passport, passport and residence, Slavic heritage, mama from Vitebsk, father's forebears, Kamenets Podolska near Lvov. I'm an intellectual, an anti-intellectual, anti-academic, distinguished professor of English, City University of New York, Manhattanite, Bro Brooklyn College faculty, Another middle-class liberal, but lower-class, second-generation immigrant. Upper-class, I own the condo loft, go to art gallery, Buddhist, vernissage dinner parties with Nayakos, Rockefeller, and the Luces. Ah, what a sissy. Professor Four Eyes. Can't catch a baseball or drive a car. Courageous Shambhala graduate warrior. Still student, Chela, disciple. My present guru, Gelek Rinpoche. Myself addressed maestro in Milan, Venice, Napoli, because septuagenarian, 
got senior citizen discount alfalfa health food New York subway. Me, Mr. Sentient Being, absolutely empty, non-being, non-not-being, neti-neti identity, maya, delusion, non-entity. <laughs> there we go. That's you all over, as they That's say right. to the scarecrow in the yeah, Wizard of Oz. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but what I'm saying is these are all the identities I identify with. And everybody's probably got as many, you know, Rotarian, uh, advertising executive, Harvard grad, uh, married, five children. Uh, That's true, you know, but the, upper but class, middle class, lower class, uh, Cadillac owner. Or but within the confines owner. of literature, people usually try to stick to one or two, whereas this is a wildly uh, well, shifting identity. I don't know. I think identity. this is uh, this is again negative capability. And Absolutely. I am large. I contain multitudes. Absolutely. I mean, it's yeah. straight out of Whitman. I was there when, or yes, I, I hear. I'm you know. I'm I was the man. I suffered. Of, you know, I, I was, was there. there. Yeah. 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 Or yeah. I was just having a good time there, you know. But one of the things that in, in this book, which presents you more, I think, than any of the other official kinds of, you know, this is Ellen Ginsberg's selected poems, kind of official books, is to present you as a songwriter. Yeah, now, this is the first time I've integrated in a book of songs, which I once did for Full Court Press, which never got circulated much. Uh, somehow I left them out of the collected poems. I think collected poems had gotten so big and it required so much extra space, and I, I think I had a battle fatigue. <laughs> there were a couple in yeah. Father no, the ones that I, uh, yeah. certain ones that I do over and over and over again. But this time I decided I'd consult my musician guru, uh, uh, Stephen Taylor, who's here with me in San Francisco for this Whitney uh, Breed exhibition at the yeah. De Young in early October. And uh, he gave me a list of the ones that, over the 20 years that we worked together, he felt were the best. Hmm. And then I put the ones I thought were interesting. Like he liked stay away from the White House, and I wouldn't yeah. have put that in, but he thought it was really good, so I put that in. And this, everybody's just a little bit homosexual. Oh, that I would put in anyway. But <laughs> yes. I never had to add it together. That's a really good one. Yes, it really is. Like an old English <laughs> musical of vaudeville <laughs> song that's it's, it's so funny, it's not even, a, it's not even shocking. It's is it also true that everybody's just a little bit heterosexual? Though? Well, yes, yes, <laughs> of course. Everybody's a little bit heterosexual, naturally. <laughs> Everybody's a little bit of a hog and a dog. Yes, I yes. say, and the lordly king of May too. Yes, yes. I Same multiple identity. Learned. Multiple identity. Same right? multiple identity. Yeah. You know, uh, no single fixed identity. Yeah. That notion of a single fixed identity goes along with monotheism. And, and it the sure notion does. Of a yeah. Fixed selfhood, which goes to heaven, is yep. preserved yep. forever. Yeah, along yeah. with the body now. Yes, in certain modes of the ego, and even in psychoanalytical yeah. uh, modes of thought. Yeah, all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can certainly well understand being against all of that stuff. Um, it's not against. It's just, it just it means it seems it's, irrelevant. Well, it yeah. seems like a limiting thing to say that you only got one identity when you got fifty, and, all f and ultimately, your ultimate identity is totally open space. Yeah. <laughs> This is close to um, maybe one other question which I'll ask you before uh, we wind up, which is that um, uh, one of the, the stories, there are a lot of themes, stories, that run through the selected poems, and uh, just a whole bunch of them. And one of them is quite clearly um, the birth of the new man. And uh, beginning, I mean, with the, uh, the uh, uh, siesta, uh, Shivova, yeah. et cetera, uh, where you talk about the There's possibility a God of a new dying God. In America, yes, yeah. and a new God. Kind of marvelous lines, actually. Well, and future then, unimaginable God. Yes, yes, marvelous. And, and, and uh, also in Wichita Vortex Sutra, by the time you get that Man far into the book, Man be of America, be born. born. Yeah. Um, that seems to have dropped out of the, um, the poems after, more or less after Wichita Vortex Sutra. Um, yeah, I think that's the Buddhist training in the realization that you don't need a Superman. Which is or, what this, this is, or, a Nietzschean Superman, yes. You, or you don't need a, well, it's ambiguous, because it could be really just go return to your humanity, like with Robert Duncan or with uh, Walt Whitman. But here, uh, I think the, the fragility and the vulnerability is uh, really more recently so clearly displayed that you don't need to say return to it, uh, especially the later poems. And also, the element of uh, uh, apocalyptic aggression has to be resolved also. One has a sense of that person in some sense or another being Neil Cassidy and, and also not being Neil Cassidy. But, positive, yeah. but yeah, but, but a sense of that. Well, with Cassidy, it was a question of, uh, he was a great macho. Uh, he was, a, you know, like a, great, a man. Yeah. Someone yesterday was saying, well, he was the man, wasn't he? Yeah, right. Someone yeah. outside of a nightclub where I was giving a reading with Diana de Prima said, well, what about Neil Cassidy? He was the man in all these people. You know, yeah. Whatever he meant by the man, the masculine, or yeah. but, uh, but and I said yes. It, and Neil and I had a long affair that we were in and out of bed, willingly or unwillingly on yeah. his part. 
sometimes all too willingly. It's a marvelous uh, for 20 poem. years. Marvelous poem, named from a play of, of William Carlos Williams. Yes, Many Loves. Yeah. Uh, it's a marvelous poem about your affair with, with well, Bill Well, the first time we bedded down together. Yeah, it's an incredible poem, and the poem yeah. you, you suppressed for a number of years, and then... Well, I didn't suppress it. I had it there, but in, uh, I read it once in a while. But while uh, Neil was alive, I was a little hesitant to lay that trip on him because it's so intimate uh, about our sexual relation. And um, he was hanging around with Ken Kesey, and I thought it might shock Kesey and sure. his uh, yeah. more macho friends. And, uh, I don't know. I don't think Kesey's ever commented on it to me you know, because it's, it's quite a human thing. It's a little bit like that uh, scene in Gus Van Sant's... Uh, uh, my own private Idaho, Idaho yes. where River Phoenix, who's supposed to be a hustler or straight, uh, actually has a crush on uh, Keanu Reeves, yeah. and they're around a fair fireside in the desert or woods, and yeah. suddenly uh, 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 River Phoenix becomes very vulnerable and tells the other guy that he really likes and loves him. And yeah. And the other guy's a little reluctant, but then realizes it's real and sincere and says, oh, why don't you come on over here? <laughs> <laughs> why not get it on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, no, why don't you come on over here yeah. and be close. And be close, yeah. Embrace right. your desire. You yeah. know, you opened up. So that that poem has that kind of vulnerability or openness. I really like it. Pull my daisy, uh, tip my cup, all my doors are open. That's uh, That was a funny little ditty. It started as pull my daisy, tip my cup, cut my thoughts for coconuts. And Kerouac took the verses home, and he came back with a slightly different form. Pull my daisy, tip my cup, all my doors are open. Yeah. Which is marvelous. And I continued, oh, yeah. cut my thoughts for coconuts, now my road is broken. What and was the title originally of that? I think Find My Fum, when it was first published, you know, Fee Fi Fo Fum, when it was first published in Neurotica magazine yeah. in 1948 or 9 or 10 or something, I don't know. But then I, there I thought there was, was a pun on, 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 on uh, that it had the word crazy in it, which is another word. Uh, that yeah, goes there's through another this book. one, but that I think comes later. This token mug I top runneth over broken, pull my daisy, tip my cup, all my eggs are broken. No, I'm a I'm a pot and God's a potter and my head's a piece of putty. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm so lucky to be nutty. It's but it's, it's, but it's, it's, it's why actually all my doors are open. It's a terrific statement. One could sort of underline yeah. it and all of that. And at the same time, Kerouac wrote it, you didn't, and it's in your book. And yeah. uh, this says something, too, about yeah. the nature of self. Well, it's a collaboration. Yeah. It's a collaboration. Well, yeah, you you wrote it. one line. You w what was the line he wrote? How's the Hicks? Oh, that's it. OK, yes. Now, he was working in a parking lot on 34th Street. And Kerouac and, and I came down to see him one midnight or 11 o'clock or before we got off work. And uh, we were we were g g rapping with this little rhyme about Where's the wake? What's the what's the how's the hex? I think was part. How's of the hex? Where's the wake? And then uh, we got up to Neil and we were repeating that. How's the hex? No, can you give me the poem? Um, oh, you know, I know. Okay. No, yeah. How's the? Uh, I was asking What's, something what's else the wake? Where's the hex? How's the hoax? Where's the wake? What's the wake? Where's the wake? What's the hex? How's the hoax? And Neil and uh, greeting Neil with Where's the wake? <laughs> what's the hex? How's the hoax? He said, uh, What's the hoax? He said, how's the Hicks? <laughs> to, me, to me and Jack. And it fits so perfectly that I just included that. So he's got that one-line contribution. Yeah, Kerouac himself also, I mean, thought of the Beat Generation as such. I mean, as, as a new American man, he says it this way. And so, yeah, sometimes, for, you know, when he was uh, more hopeful about it. Yes, when he was more hopeful about it, yes. Well, a, apparently that's what it was. New American men intent on joy. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it, that's basically what it was, and I think it's becoming clearer and clearer that there was some slight change of planetary consciousness, you might almost say, or a return to a more earthen consciousness, or a return to mama, uh, mother nature, in the 60s after uh, the high civilization had taken over from the original energetic culture and had begun cutting itself off from its roots. There was a return to the land, like the, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. you know, a lot of country folk are going back to the country or communes. One of the ways ecology, notions of ecology, notions of more natural diet, a more regular diet, notions of uh, midwifery instead of hospital, notions of more natural mixed medicines or Tibetan or Chinese or indigenous medicines, notions of indigenous drugs like mushrooms and peyote and their, their synthetic friends. So that it is in notions of a peaceful world rather than constant war, awareness of anger, anti-militarism. Um, sexual revolution, sure. or yeah. sexual vulnerability, yeah. candor, frankness, 
So all those are, in, in a sense, conditions for a new kind of mind. Candor cures paranoia. Yeah. You say. Candor ends. Ends paranoia. paranoia excuse Candor me. was a word that Walt Whitman used. I think yes. I've uh, yeah. said so many times, pointing out preface to the 1855 first edition of Leaves of Grass. He hoped that American poets would uh, evolve to uh, specialize in candor. As the cheapest of virtues. The least sincerity expensive. is the key to bliss yeah. in this eternity, yeah. you say, in a book that, in a poem that didn't make it actually into the yeah. selected. Well, it's a minor rap lyric. But, but, and Kerouac says, but I want to be sincere. Right. And but I want to uh, be sincere. Uh, yeah, and then you remember that. And, and, Certainly and, yeah. did to, to, to on tele- national television. Yes, he sure did. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and that's, that's part of what um, is so, uh, part of the attraction of this book is this drive towards truth, even though truth is never an absolute. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, no. Here's the here's the key. You can be absolutely truthful. Truth is an absolute in this sense that you can truthfully put down what you thought. What you thought may be true or not yes, true. Yes, right. Yes. But yes. you do have your mind is open to it. Yes. your mind. My mind is open to itself. Everybody's mind is open to itself. Yes. In a sense, there's hardly any unconscious. Yeah. Yeah. You I know agree. what yeah. you really I agree. think. Yeah. So if you can quote yourself. If you can describe your mind, the process of thoughts in your mind, like the open field thing of Olson, where one, in, when one perception leads instant her onto another perception, if you're actually able to be accurate, then you have at least a truthful sketch of your preoccupations and the movement of your mind and the way it thinks. It couldn't be absolute because you can't get all the thoughts and you yeah. can't get the exact sequence, but you can approximate it. Yeah, yeah. So you can approximate an absolute truth. But you can't guarantee uh, an absolute truth of reproduction of the nature of the mind or the structure or the sequence of thought forms that rise in the mind. That you can't guarantee that any of these thought forms will actually be true thoughts. I mean, yeah. the, 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 uh, the, the so thoughts themselves. These may not correspond to reality, yeah. but except to the reality of your mind, which was well, thinking about that time. You're, you're notating what you yeah. thought. Yes, and, yes. And, and that's not so hard to be truthful about that. If you're and, a, and you say that the uh, project is to widen the area of consciousness. One of the, one of the yeah. great moments... In, um, in, in your poetry is in the middle of Wichita Vortex Sutra, which takes place in the middle of Kansas, in the middle yeah. of America, you suddenly start talking about these Indian uh, holy yeah. men. And suddenly into the middle of this Western poem, all about the West and these states, which is upon, yeah. et cetera, all of that, uh, in the middle of all of that, suddenly in pops the East and an incredible consciousness of the East. And that's one of the things, I think it's like Lou Harrison's movies, Uh or music, excuse me, uh, uh, in the sense that he's bringing Eastern modes into the Mm -hmm. West, and I think you really did that. Uh, You mentioned that O'Hara, Frank O'Hara, as great a poet as he was, and he was a wonderful poet, uh, it was France, really, for him. He never got very far East at all. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, except for New York, if we want to call that the the, the Far East from here, uh, but uh, he was never able to as free as his when poetry he, was. When did he, he never die? When did he die? Um, 1960 or no later than that. A little later, not much later than that. Maybe uh, yeah, maybe 60. I was in India then. See. Yeah, you have some nice poems about him. Actually, yeah, he has some I nice poems him. about you uh, as well. There's a sad, there's a poem which you... My back, Sad Self. My Sad Self. It's in his style, sort of. Or thinking of his walking up Fifth Avenue. It, it is, but you know what's funny? It's, it's, it's also the exact opposite of an O'Hara poem, which is that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I think when I see, read your poem, I think uh, how funny you are today, New York, like Ginger Rogers in Swing Time, yeah. that O'Hara poem, et cetera, uh, from the lunch poems. Uh, your poem uh, seems the complement of that. O'Hara swinging around New York, bopping into, you know, meeting all kinds of people, buying yeah. things, doing this, that. Um, your Mine poems, is more solitary. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and sad, and thinking of yourself as isolated from people, yeah. whereas Frank was so social. Except that it, it's not just thinking of myself. Everybody in New York has at one time or other been alone, walking up Fifth Avenue no at question. Christmas or something like that, feeling the great solitude of the city. Absolutely. It's one of the great experiences of a great megalopolis. Feeling that one solitude amid the myriad, Whitman registered it. Everybody registered it. It's not that I'm neurotically sad, or even oh, normally that, right? sad, or even yeah. average-wise sad. What I'm saying is that it, it's a common experience, and it doesn't mean that you're really alone. It doesn't mean that you haven't got your friends and your lovers and your family and all that. It just means that there is this moment when you realize that everyone is ultimately alone in the grave or in life, and in no place more dramatic to realize it is going window shopping on Upper Fifth Avenue among the millionaire sacks and 
in the uh, FAO Schwartz or whatever they got up there, now Cartier, yeah. and 57th Street and Fifth Avenue is a place to really experience the g being alone with the alone. Um, yeah, the uh, um, Ballad of the Skeletons. Yeah. I mean, you suddenly have this sense of the skeletons all around you. I think, too, that, that um, uh, one of the things about your poetry, which is strong in the book, is the presentation of life. Born into this world, you've got to suffer. Is the presentation of life as suffering. Well, that's a, that's a very uh, basic schematic Buddhist poem. Yes. It, 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 uh, the Four Noble it, Truths. And well, it's the first of three marks three. of existence in, yes. the, in the first stanza. Born in this world, you've got to suffer. Everything changes. You've got no soul. soul. Those three, two, uh, three points are the, what they call the three characteristics of existence. That, that, that is to say, uh, birth, uh, well, birth into the existence contains suffering. Um, uh, and partly because everything is constantly changing and transmuting, like in Heraclitus, you can't step in the same river twice. Once, yes, says yes. Corso. Yes. You can't step in the same river <laughs> once, and and uh, there is no permanent selfhood or anatma. Yeah. Or I'm saying here, you got no soul, like yeah. the yeah. American vernacular, you know, yeah. in a shocking way of saying it. Yeah. And then it goes on in the second stanza to outline the four noble truths. Uh, and then the Eightfold Path is given. Uh, and so it's a schematic thing. And then a review of the senses, the sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, yes. and so forth. It's the whole book is actually marked with Buddha's footprint. A lot it's of the it, emblem. Yeah. It's the emblem on the book's cover. And yeah. it's, 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 I mean, uh, you the see... The three fish I first yeah. saw at Bodh Gaya on a gigantic 10-foot sculptured footprint of Buddha from the days when they didn't have images of a human being, when they had an umbrella or a, uh, a parasol, or a wheel of dharma, or a footprint, as as the symbol of the passer through, mm -hmm. the one who passes through the, well, the, the lonesome traveler. Yeah. yeah, it's one the, of the, one the of wanderer, things. the wandering Jew. Yes, yeah, I was I was thinking that, of course. <laughs> yes, or the rootless cosmopolitan, as right. you wittily put it, uh, quoting from uh, uh, Stalin. Stalin. Yes, <laughs> image for the yeah, Jew. That was his idea of Jews. Yeah. There's yes, and, and of course, I mean that's part of the play of cosmopolitan greetings. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it. I'm glad you got that. <laughs> yeah, right now. It's You're a very good reader, I must say. It's a, these are very good poems. Yeah, <laughs> You're, You're a very a, good writer. <laughs> no, but you get all you get all the, all the subtleties of what's going on in a nice way. I, I haven't seen any reviews that ever caught that, you know, cosmopolitan is a pun on Stalin's word for Jews, and I am cosmopolitan and rootless cosmopolitan yeah. and so forth. Cosmopolitan well, greetings. See, the, the point of that was I was sending the, the title poem to behind uh, the socialist curtains. Ah, uh, yes. To Struga, at the time before the breakdown of the Marxist uh, dictatorships. In Macedonia, they have a uh, biennial um, evenings of poetry where they give a golden crown, golden laurel crown. Actually, a real piece of gold crown. Mm. You know, the laurel leaves. Yes, beautiful. To a poet every two years, and I got one that year, but they asked me to send greetings for their program before I came, so I put these one-liners together, which are aesthetic and also political and metaphysical. And, um, you know, stay, uh, what, stay away, you know, fight governments, fight gods. That's right. Why don't we actually, why don't we, we can end with, with this. Okay, so it's a little Ars Poetica. Yes. But alas, the clock wasn't with us, and <laughs> we don't have time for it. Um, I'll play to another point um, in the programs. Uh, this is Jack Foley, and I've been broadcasting an interview I did with Allen Ginsberg on October 4th, 1996, in San Francisco. Thanks to Alan for such a wonderful interview. I had a great time, and so evidently uh, did he. I'll be back in a few weeks. Thanks for listening. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, KPFA. Happy birthday to you. Hi, this is Richard Walensky, host of Book Waves, Art Waves, airing Thursdays at 1 p.m., wishing KPFA a happy 75th birthday. What I wanted to get to was, was um, one of the things that strikes me um,
Welcome to Cover to Cover. I'm your host, Nina Serrano. My guest today is Louise Moises, a graduate of San Jose State, who was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, where she still resides. She's been a teacher, a storyteller, a puppeteer, and the owner of an antiquarian bookstore. She started writing poetry in 2017 as a means of dealing with grief. Her first chapbook, Peace is a Pelican, will be available in April from Finishing Line Press. Louise particularly enjoys performance poetry, and some of her featured readings are available on YouTube. Welcome, Louise Moises, to Literary Dialogues. I'm honored to be asked to read today and to be on uh, pr with my prestigious friend, Nina. Well, I'm really happy to be here with you, and I'm eager to hear your poetry today, as I always am. Oh, thank you. So what have you prepared for us today? I thought I would read one that's kind of a favorite of mine. It actually is inspired by a visit to BLM land outside of Delta, Utah, a very vast and open area with no paved roads, and it's where the wild horses graze. And the poem is entitled, Arroyos. In this parched Utah landscape, horses travel in arroyos on silent hoofs move towards water. A sturdy white mare guides her foal the rest of her herd follows through dry washes. They run towards the spring. I have hidden my love for you in a deep arroyo when I should have sent it running with the horses. At first, too cautious, too fearful of another loss. Before you came, my landscape parched and arid like the land of central Utah. You guided me towards sustaining springs. Together, we watched the horses drink, followed them as they disappeared into arroyos. They left only dust rising above the desert ditches. The sun vanished behind the rolling hills, the stars reflected in the spring. Somewhere beyond the arroyos, the horses hid in protective herds, slept standing up as horses do, while you and I lay beneath the midnight sky in the quiet arroyos of each other's arms. I dreamt of horses at the spring and yielded to the icy water. Lovely. What is an arroyo exactly? So arroyo is a, basically a desert ditch that's been uh, dug by repeated flash floods. So it, arroyo is a fast wash of water that washes away the bank and then the arroyo will be dry during most of the year until the monsoons come, creating these torrential rainstorms. Flash flood washes more pieces of the bank away and leaves this empty arroyo where the horses run through. It's a dangerous area. You have to be very careful not to be caught in an arroyo because like, you could easily be swept away by a flash flood. I don't often write in rhyme, but I thought I would bring one of the rhymed poems that kind of, that I wrote really early on when I was widowed for a second time. And that's when I started writing poetry in a very direct way. And my first poems were about grief and loss. And I still go back to that subject kind of on a regular basis. But this is one of my few rhyming poems, Empty Chairs. 
I search for him in all the chairs, but every day he isn't there. The yellow dining chair bereft of shoulders broad, his chest, his neck. The wooden stool where once he sat perched upon the kitchen mat, he was there to prep a dish, peel a vegetable, bone a fish. And on the deck, the slatted chair, its arms all stiff with vacant air. No more a conversation shared. I cannot hear the voice that cared. The garden bench beside the wall, where once he read in spring and fall, the cat now sleeps upon his place. I cannot see his smiling face. The office chair that does not roll, that creaked the floor and took its toll of difficult financial times, checks to write and poems to rhyme. The recliner sits in upright space, no feet to rest, no back to brace. The bedroom chair without his clothes. My mind in logic surely knows he'll not return to take a seat, but my heart with longing prays to meet the man that sat in all those chairs could he once more find comfort there? How beautiful. You know, even despite that it's rhyming, it's very sad, despite the rhyme. I've recently taken uh, a poetry class from the poet emeritus, uh, poet laureate emeritus of Emeryville, Sarah Kobrinsky. And for 30 days, she gave us a prompt every morning and one of the prompts was to write a cento, which is a poem made up of lines from other poets. So I had a great time reading many, many poems, and I used 14 different poets in this cento. I used Dudley Randall, Sarah Teasdale, Alfred Lord Tennyson, Shelley, Ted Couser, Howard Nemiroff, William Collins, Robert Frost, Emily Dickinson, Edgar Allan Poe, Edna St. Vincent Millay, Kenneth Rexroth, and Robert Penn Warren. So the poem is Night Ascento. I saw night close down on earth like a great dark wing. The veils are drawn about the world. The drowsy lights along the paths are dimmed and pearled. Now sleeps the crimson petal, now the white. I arise from dreams of thee in the sweet sleep of night and moonbeams kiss the sea. Above us stars Beneath us constellations, five billion miles away, a galaxy dies like a snowflake falling on water. All night, the cities like shimmering novas and spoke the speechless world and sang the towers of the city into the astonished sky. Now night, is hushed, save where the weak-eyed bat with short, shrill shriek and flits by on leathern wing. I have been acquainted with the night as all heaven were a bell. Through luminous windows saw spirits move musically. Under my head till morning but the rain is full of ghosts tonight that tap and sigh. Midnight breaks with driving clouds and plunging moon. Rare vasts of endless stars and a dark time. The eye begins to see. 
Thank you to 14 amazing poets. Those were 14 amazing poets, beautiful poets, and read very, very expressively. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, a lot of people know that during the summer, I travel across the country to see my family and I drive my big old RV uh, on my own. So um, I wrote this poem about my travels and I write a lot as I'm on the road. I write a haiku every day. And then I write about the different scenery that I see. The Arroyo poem actually originated when my husband and I used to travel together. And this particular poem just won an award at uh, the Aina Kubrit Circle. It's in Congratulations. Thank you. Um, it's entitled A Night at the Rest Stop. In my 79th year, except for the companionship of my cat, I travel solo in my 23 foot RV, crisscrossing the country to visit family. In the passenger seat, the phantom of my husband who journeys on another plane. Each mile we converse, I describe the scenery, recall the days when he could answer. At dusk, I look for a place to spend the night. Tonight I'm in Kansas, a secure and spacious rest stop surrounded by trees populated by trucks, cars, and other motorhomes. On this heated night, I crawl into my narrow corner bed, draw only the sheet over my body. The hum of semi-generators lulls me to sleep, and I dream. A dream invaded by pounding, loud and insistent, fully awake. I click on my phone, 1 a.m. The pounding continues. It's on my motorhome door. Traveling solo has its risks. Grady Cat stares at the vibrating door, his body tense, ears rotating. He dances from side to side, sniffing the air. I whisper to him, what should we do? What would my husband have done? I move to the window adjacent to the door. A woman looks up at me, stops pounding, mouths something. I cannot understand. Hearing aids on the charger. I shake my head in denial and lower the blinds. My heart pounds like the concussion on the door. I hold my breath. All is quiet, save for the diesel generators. I worry about the woman. I worry about my safety. I climb back in bed, stare at the light dancing on the ceiling as it seeps through the overhead vent. I invent various scenarios. Maybe she's a kidnap victim, lost, confused, hungry, alone. Or perhaps it's a trap, trying to get someone to open a door. If she is truly in danger, there are other people, a parking area filled with vehicles. Mystery, unsolved, I toss and turn. Ask my absent husband to hold me, protect me as he had promised. Gradually, I fall back to sleep. There is no more pounding. Well, I'm glad to see you made it through that night. <laughs> I never know what the adventure is going to be. I've had written a lot about my journey. I'm hoping that at some point I can gather it all together and put it into a, a chapbook that's devoted to the travel. 
Well, you have a chapbook coming out this April, Poetry Month. Very exciting. Yes, I am. Some of my pieces from that journey are in that, but sometimes they're beautiful things I see and sometimes not so beautiful. So I just never know. This one is um, about my dad. This one was published in a really interesting anthology called GI. And it was all about military life and people that either wrote poems or flash fiction about their experience in the military. And I saw a call for submissions and I thought about this memory I had of my father. My father flew in blimps. In World War II, my father flew in blimps, great gray whales of the air floating on a hum of small engines, dipping above the house where my mother lived before she was my mother or he my father. She ran out under the porch, wildly waving in her innocence, believing he could hear her voice, throwing her love into the sky. With a bulbous navy blimp teetered above the house. Windy day, whoosh of wind, scrapes the caw cawing crows across the baby blue blanket of a sky bends the branches in cracking ache, sets the chimes to clinking and tinkling, pushes open the creaking gate, launches the plastic garbage can bang banging against the house. Within, I sit at the computer, click clacking the keys, listening to nature's cacophony. Through the window, I watch the dance, Warblers wrangle a twitter twitter, woodpecker peck pecking on the lichen licked branches of the ancient tree. Across the street, Johanna dances, singing tra la la as the wind whizzes whipping in her chiffon skirt. She giggles and wiggles, pushing at the billowing. Is that the poet, Johanna Ely, that you're referring to? You no, know it is not. It's a little girl who lives across the street, and I can see her from my office window. And I have written a couple of poems about her. And sometimes she's bouncing her ball against the wall, and she's kind of a lonely soul. But at this, on this particular day, she was like out dancing with the wind, and everything was making noise. And I could hear her voice calling to the wind above the howl as it went by the house. How wonderful. You captured it. Thank you. I love to write from nature and everything is kind of inspired by nature in a way, but this one's kind of a fun poem. Jackrabbit. In heated afternoon, Jackrabbit and I, the only ones on the trail, his majestic ears spoil an effort at camouflage. He senses my presence, stands perfectly still, unblinking in harmony with brambles, a totem of the high desert. Around a scent of dry summer grasses, pungent aroma of sun-baked sage, an incense benediction in this tabernacle of southwestern landscape. Unseen song, sparrow trills, clear pleasing notes, light and slightly husky. Soloist at the altar, no need of a choir. A lizard so thin, I almost missed him rests in the shadow of a boulder. I lean on my walking stick, wipe the sweat from my forehead, sip from my water bottle, linger, unwilling to break the spell. I take a few cautious steps, 
keep an eye on the rabbit. I could stand here for hours, maybe even days. Yet I know in this life, there is only moving forward. Oh, that's wonderful. There's only moving forward and you have certainly done that. Do you have a few more for us? Would you like a concluding poem? Or do you need one in between? Uh, I'll take in between. One in between. Okay, let's see. <coughs> a lizard's trek. A lizard, the color of kaibab sandstone, skips and scampers across an array of Navajo blankets displaying a rainbow of native crafts meant to tempt the browsing tourist. The lone lizard roams over tightly woven baskets, mounting and descending a row of silver necklaces, burning his feet on the sun-warmed amulets of hematite. Its blade toes race across a tangle of turquoise bracelets around the curvature of a hand-coiled pot etched with images of corn maidens. He mounts a soapstone sculpture of an iguana matching reptile for reptile. From his perch, he stares down at his prey, a singular leggy lean red ant who stops and waits just out of reach knowing somehow the length of the lizard's sticky tongue. Like a magic stage magician, the ant vanishes down a hole, too small for the lizard's girth. The lizard performs a disappointment dance, swaying from side to side, executing four fine push-ups, then scurrying for safety in camouflage. Beneath an overhanging rock, the lizard watches as the bronze-skinned Navajo offers a bracelet to a pale woman with soft round arms. Money and smiles are exchanged. Neither Navajo nor woman are aware that a lizard stepped upon the bracelet, leaving sacred hidden messages with his toes. Oh, I like that. Hidden messages. I actually saw a lizard running across the Navajo blanket and all these artifacts. And I thought, there is a poem there. And it there certainly was. Yeah, it took me a lot of revision. And um, it won a, a prize at uh, the Artist Embassy Inter International a few years ago. Uh, so do you do a lot of rewriting? I do. I do. I work a lot on revision and I enjoy revision. Um, I belong to several critique groups and uh, one meets twice a month on Zoom and we bring, there's six of us in the group, we each bring a poem and we do it in three kind of phases. The first phase, people say what they really liked about the poem, lines that they particularly liked or the style or whatever. And then the second, the poet asks questions of the critique group about the poem. And then third, the, the poet asks for whatever critique might be helpful in uh, polishing the poem. And uh, I, I really enjoy my group. And I learn from critiquing other people's poems as well as them critiquing mine. And, you know, I read in um, a book on poetry by Mary Oliver that sometimes she would revise a poem 50 times, and I weary at about three or four. So, yes, <laughs> yes. So, you have a final poem for us. Okay, so I'm going to read the final poem, which um, is Part of uh, the line from it is uh, Pieces of Pelican, which is the title of my chapbook. So this is the final poem in my chapbook. Peace is. 
Peace is a sunset seen through a veil of fog, lacy waves lapping sandy shore, alone with the tide, salty fragrance of the sea, listening to the mantra of crash and recede, crash and recede on into infinity. Peace is a pelican framed against an aqua sky, soaring along the shore, unaware of wars, winging above waves, a prehistoric vision, would that I could fly on the wings of a pelican. Peace is the discovery of an ancient oak, gnarled, bent, enduring, an elder with stories to tell. Listen, snap of twigs, crack of branches, rustle of grasses around the depths of roots, a history. Peace is a small girl on a big horse, rounding a barrel in a dusty rodeo arena, a crowd of friends, family, and perfect strangers, all cheering a unity of the moment, the many as one. Peace is being alone with a waterfall, chill splash of rushing, roaring water, fragrance of pine, swoop of swallows singing, standing beneath a cascading curtain of water. Peace is a birth of monarchs. From cracked chrysalises, wet stained glass wings, struggling to open and close, thin black legs, clinging to feathery fronds of milkweed. Peace is a prayer whispered in shadows, a large clanging bell, angle of ceiling, scent of incense, flicker of candles. Peace is finding a church within your heart. Peace as a solitary figure in a high desert landscape, scent of heated sage, sky as large as it can ever be, a rocky line where earth meets clouds, then a simple gesture, a wave of love. Oh, how lovely, a wave of love. Beautiful, a perfect place for us to end. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. It was my great pleasure. Please join the KPFA Local Station Board for a Zoom Town Hall meeting on Saturday, May 18th from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. For more information, visit kpfa.org or email outreach at kpfa.org. Again, that's Saturday, May 18th from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB Berkeley, and 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR Santa Cruz, 94.3 K232FC in Monterey, and always online at kpfa.org.